Welcome to Strange Familiars. Allison? Yes. How are you? Pretty good. Quite an interesting show tonight. I feel like it's a departure. You think? Well, I mean, it's pretty on brand. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can tell which episodes are the ones that I want to do and which ones are the ones you want to do. I think there's a, you know, in the Venn diagram of Strange Familiars, there's probably some crossover there, but generally, yeah. So just think of this as like Bigfoot Craft Night. <laughs> Well, it certainly has an enticing title, The Victorian Blood Book. Not to be confused with Clive Barker's Books of Blood. Yeah, they came a little later. Still a dated reference. I know. (laughs) Clive who? (laughs) Well, before we get into the bloody book, I want to thank our patrons. Thank you, patrons. Thank you for your support. Thank you for everything you do, because we couldn't do Strange Familiars without your help and your support. If you like what we do at Strange Familiars and you'd like to help us continue to make the podcast and get extra content besides, you can become a patron at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. There's different tiers of support there, but no matter what tier you choose, our patrons get two full extra episodes, exclusive episodes of Strange Familiars every month. Again, it's at patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. I guess before we get into the show proper, we should talk about how we found this book. The interesting thing is... Neither one of us remember. (laughs) Yeah. I sort of remember seeing an image online and thinking, this is really in Allison's wheelhouse. Now, you might have shown me that image. Like, you might have found the image first. I, I don't know. And... You look for this book and you could only find a Spanish edition. I think that's, I think that's all it was printed in, yeah. And I remember ordering it from one place and, and waiting for weeks and then they just decided not to, like, that they didn't have it. And I tried another place and finally got a copy of it. But because it was in Spanish, I would never really knew any background about it. Yeah. So when did you start digging into it? Just recently? Yeah, just recently. And that's when I found out some really interesting parallels to other things I was already interested in. Well, it involves Victoriana, scrapbooking, mm-hmm. old books, cool engravings, and, and similar artwork. Sort of outsider art, for lack of a better term. And blood. And blood. Yeah, it's, it's kind of got, it ticks a lot of boxes for me. <laughs> <laughs> So while we don't remember exactly how we found out about this book, we do know how the world found out about this book. When Evelyn Wall's collection of books and art was given to the Harry Ransom Humanities Research Center, that's at the University of Texas in Austin. And this is available online. Can you put the link up for people? Yeah, I can put it in the show notes. This is something where you can kind of follow along, picture pages style. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> Another dated reference, which references Bill Cosby. Just cut that right out. <laughs> we could also do a film strip, out. <laughs> yeah, we could do a film strip. You can see every single page of this book online at the Harry Ransom Humanities Research Library's website. So amongst this collection of Evelyn Wall's 
art and books and manuscripts and so forth when it was donated to the Harry Ransom Research Center was this very strange book, which has become known as the Libro Victoriano de la Sangre, or the Victorian Book of Blood, or more commonly, the Victorian Blood Book. This is a Victorian scrapbook, right? Mm -hmm. A one-off. The only copies that were made are these reproductions that were made in book form in, I think, 2019. Which is kind of a craft, right, of the, of the Victorian time, this scrapbooking. Yeah, I, I used to buy, there was a revival of decoupage and scrapbooking and, and collage kind of in the 90s, and decoupage was kind of popular. Again, they were, released a lot of books about how to do decoupage, but I'm going to reveal the secret right now. It's just scissors and glue. <laughs> <laughs> and if you find something cool and you have some Mod Podge and you have a pair of scissors, you fix it with a Mod Podge and then you cover it with the Mod Podge and you're pretty much done. Now, there are people that have elevated it really to like fine craft. And there were people in the Victorian era who would use Victor what they call Victorian scraps, which are pre-produced kind of pop out figures and flowers, flowers, whimsical little subject matter, Birds, lots of children, yeah. nature themes, and then they would make elaborate screens and cover tables. And then there's even a technique where you use like thick, heavy white glue on the inside of glass. Well, this Victorian blood book kind of surpassed the medium as well. It kind of became this work of art, not just a scrapbook. Each page is decorated with these clippings of engravings, the religious scenes, historical scenes like natural history things, Victorian scrap, like you mentioned, there's there's mm -hmm. flowers and stuff from Victorian scrap. A lot of it comes from what would have been pretty expensive books at the time that other people wouldn't have had necessarily access to, like engravings from some of William Blake's illustrated books. There's, I think, I read, I don't know, like tens of, of books would have have to have been destroyed to make this. Yeah. Uh, at it, a time when they would have been pretty precious. Right. If you're familiar with Dover Books, they publish these collections of public domain artwork that you can use for whatever. If we used to, back in the zine days, people used to, you know, use them to decorate their pages or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's taken from these old, you know, Victorian era books, a lot of it, these engravings and stuff. It looks like he had a whole collection of, of Dover books. That he was <laughs> yeah. But he had the original books. He had the original books he, that was, he was cutting, cutting up. up. A lot of it is religious themed. Amongst this, the scrapbook element are like handwritten copies of poems and scripture and lots and lots and lots of blood. Made from Red India ink. Every page. Every page. It doesn't look unlike a 15-year-old goth girl's <laughs> art projects, <laughs> but like on an elevated level. And again, this is not a published book. This is a one-of-a-kind book. They There's think, only one. And they think it was given originally from the maker to his daughter on the occasion of her wedding. Well, let's talk about Victorian scrapbooking in general. I know it was a major pastime because we come upon these scrapbooks regularly. Mm -hmm. Is this the beginning of the decoupage movement, you know, right then? I mean, there were times when people did this previous to that, but it really had a resurgence in the during the Victorian era. I mean, they're just sort of like mired in sentimentality and mm -hmm. just like these sort of uh, ornamental, memorial, sentimental themes are just in the blood of Victorians. And so in everything they do, it comes out. Whether it's an autograph book, a scrapbook, little friendship books, this is very common in the Victorian era. And it kind of continued. What, scrapbooking or? Well, I mean, scrapbooking, obviously. Yeah, definitely. Like, but... it, it had a huge resurgence recently. Yeah. But this idea of, uh, say, friendship books, I know when you were young, you used to participate heavily in that world. Yeah, and it really had its start in the Victorian era, which then carried over to people that did collage and mail art during our time when we were younger. This was a part and parcel of the sort of punk rock pen-palling scene was mail art and 
Yeah, kind Friendship of books. hand in hand with, with zines, which was another really cut and paste project. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, people weren't making zines on their computer. There was rubber cement involved. Yeah, you were typing stuff up or handwriting stuff and cutting out stuff. I remember when my brother was making his, he was always looking for cool background pages mm -hmm. to put text over. So he would take old phone books and just use pages from old phone books or, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. And if you had a friend that had access to a, a Xerox machine at work? They were a friend indeed. They were a friend indeed. Do you remember slam books, which are like friendship books, but they would, you would ask a question? Oh, yeah. yeah. That actually comes from earlier era, like Proust did that. Wow. They had like questionnaires where they would ask people questions and people would... Everyone in a row would answer questions about it and the exquisite corpse. And like these were like fun kind of parlor games that people engaged in. Mm -hmm. The fact that we were still doing them in the late 80s and early 90s is, <laughs> I sometimes I feel like it seems like a bazillion years ago, but the, the only thing was it was just like pre internet. Right. And yeah. it was the only way to connect with people who might have some, you might have something in common with that you would have no way of meeting otherwise. Right. In the pre internet era. Yeah. And so I think we, we've explained this before, but for anyone, I don't know that this was like a common practice if you weren't into like mail art or pen palling, but friendship books are basically like a little book with stapled pieces of paper. Each person decorates a page with their address and then passes it on to someone they know who passes it on to another person and eventually gets sent back to the original person. And in that, then you have a little collection of people with their interests and their creative abilities in this little book. And then you can choose whether you want to write to any of those people or not. Right. And that's how a lot of people found other pen pals in that time period. I have a huge collection of them. My sister has a huge collection of them. She's written extensively about that and then their relation to mixtapes and just sort of DIY creativity, punk rock culture in general. And so... So this scrapbook, this Victorian book of blood, it's made with these expensive books that not everyone would have had access to. Most people wouldn't, as a general rule. So, I mean, I, to me, it always seems like a judgment call, like what is fine craft or craft versus art? Because like to me, like Dada's collage, that would get a lot of praise as being art, whereas this would be considered some form of craft. And to me, that those are sub very subjective. Yeah. When does craft become art? Yeah, when it's fine craft. Is that is that when fine craft is elevated to art? It's like we always talk about how illustration is sort of like the bastard younger brother of painting, mm -hmm. and it gets no respect, even though a lot of illustrators are equally, if not more talented than a lot of painters. Right. Yeah. So I think of it in terms of uh, of that, that craft is sort of like the bastardized younger brother. And at what point, yeah, I think you could easily argue that this Victorian blood book has been changed enough. So he's, he's taking this original source material, mm -hmm. he's representing it, mm -hmm. he's recontextualizing it in, in some cases, he's adding to it. Mm-hmm. And it becomes different. I don't want to say more than, but mm -hmm. it becomes different than its some parts. Which is kind of ironic because in a way it's sort of a nod towards postmodernism, right? Where you're you're just collecting other things, recontextualizing them and putting them out as your own creation. Right. But it's in this era that is no longer fashionable at the time that this book is eventually passed on to its next owner. How did this book end up at Harry Ransom? Well, after the family sold it, uh, it was acquired in the 1950s by the author Evelyn Waugh. Now, who's he? Well, if first thing I'm going to mention is if you have never seen the early 80s British production of it's a miniseries. It's it's hailed as one of the best miniseries ever. Called Brideshead Revisited. It's his book about his days in Oxford. That's the Jeremy Irons joint? Yes, it is. <laughs> a 
a young Jeremy Irons living this life of, of meeting up with a very wealthy family and becoming kind of ensconced in their family. And that's based on? Evelyn Wall's own experiences as this sort of um, Oxford dandy. So he's an author. He is an author. And he has an incredibly interesting trajectory in his life. He goes from writing Brideshead Revisited, which in some circles is hailed as one of the first sort of homoerotic novels. Mm -hmm. And then he also has a mental breakdown. He gets married and divorced, converts to Catholicism, has a slew of children, and then eventually decides he'd rather live with his books. (laughs) As you do. As you do. (laughs) So uh, he's one of those people, I feel like there's like a dividing line. Some people think it is around the time that Brideshead Revisited was written between his life as sort of a young, dandy, aesthetic kind of artist. So I found this quote from him because he's very matter-of-fact. I've been watching a lot of older interviews. He's just smoking a cigar and sort of nonplussed by people trying to engage in getting him to talk about these rather controversial parts of his life, like when he starts talking to people during his mental breakdown or when he alludes to homosexual relationships or his conversion to Catholicism. And they they kind of uh, allude to him like not being this sort of dandy anymore. And he says, in middle life, one doesn't have to dress up in special clothes in order to enjoy architecture. And I found that very... (laughs) That's a great quote. (laughs) It it has a lot of relevance to people in middle age. It's no longer necessary to have these demarcations of identity. Mm -hmm. My allergies are bugging me, so if you hear me drinking water, audience, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Evelyn Wall collected Victoriana. He which, wrote a book on Rossetti when it was wildly unpopular to like pre-Raphaelites. Victoriana in general wasn't something. Now, the cycle is much quicker nowadays. Mm-hmm. It's what, 15 years now, right? If that, I think it's probably four months. <laughs> 15 years, whatever was going on 15 years ago was suddenly popular. and, and mm-hmm. But back then it was a, a little bit. I think it was more decade or. or few decades. Few decades. So and when he's, he's coming out of Edwardian times, right? Yes, he was born around, I think, 1903. And it's... That's his parents' generation. You know, during the 30s and 40s when everyone's, you know, very future-bound, metropolis, everything's art deco, stylish, sleek. Mm-hmm. He is still collecting heavy Victorian furniture and decorating in that sort of dated, maximalist style, as we would refer to it today writing about the pre-Raphaelites who were not in vogue at that time. They were just seen as, like, the relics of a bygone era. And he didn't care. He didn't care. <laughs> he was, I he think, liked what he liked. Yeah, I think he was one of those people who was just sort of passionately himself. And while he definitely had some struggles, didn't particularly care what other people thought of him because I don't really think he was so much a people person. He'd rather just be collecting books. There's a letter that I found online one time, and I actually keep this on my phone. I keep it on the desktop of my computer. Someone had written to Ray Bradbury and asked him what was the most important decision he'd ever made. And he writes back to this person. It was a kid, right? I think so. He says, Dear William, most important decision I ever made came at age nine. I was collecting Buck Rogers comic strips, 1929, when my fifth grade classmates made fun of me. I tore up the strips... A week later, broke into tears. Why was I crying? I wondered. Who died? Me was the answer. I have torn up the future. What to do about it? Start collecting Buck Rogers all over again. Fall in love with the future. I did just that. And after that, never listened to one damn idiot classmate who doubted me. What did I learn? To be myself, and only myself, and never let others, prejudiced, interfere with my life. Kids do the same. Be your own self. Love what you love. Best wishes, Ray Bradbury. I find that incredibly powerful. And it's such good advice, I think. Just love what you love. The thing is, if you live long enough, whatever you like will be in vogue at some point. <laughs> but don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it is or if it isn't. It seemed like Evelyn Wall was like this. He loved what he loved, right? He just... Yeah, even... I mean, I think he comes off as sort of curmudgeonly in some respects, but... um I think he just had a, a good sense of what he liked. Now, presumably, Wall got this from the family, this book? Yeah, he bought it in the 50s after the war. 
it's a time when he suggests to his wife, during the war he's, he's drafted, which is an unlikely part of his trajectory because he was so academic mm-hmm. and his, his world was so, or his foot was so much in that world. So then he has a lot of time to review and think about things during the war. And he's looking forward to a time when it's over and he suggests to his wife that when it's over that perhaps he would take over a house he recently inherited part of from an aunt or uncle that he would start to put all of his collections in that, including his books, and he would live there and get to work there. And she could have the house with the kids all to herself. <laughs> Benevolent fella. Yeah, kind of like, I mean, kind of like a Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera situation where it's like, let's all have our own space. <laughs> <laughs> and so he he really dives into collecting fine first editions of books. And that's when he acquires this one-off. Now, I don't know how it is that he acquires it. I have some theories based on where some of the other artwork by this artist ends up. Can you imagine walking into an antique shop or being at an auction and seeing this book? Me personally? Yeah. I would have sat there and and not gone to the bathroom all day and waited for the off chance that that was going to be the time that it was going to come up at the auction. For auction. Yeah. Yeah. And I would have just sat there and just kept going, "Mm -hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. (laughs) I seem to remember, it wasn't a book of this magnitude, but there was a book, we were at a postcard show, and a guy had some effect. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking. It was like almost like an astronomy-based thing, was like a home-done kind of like, like a homemade sort of mystical astrological thing. Yeah. And we looked at it and we're like, oh, we need to get this. And then we just didn't have the money for it. Yeah. And we sold it. I can tell you exactly, I mean, I know exactly who it was that sold it. (laughs) Yeah, I, I can... Picture the stand yeah. uh, where he sets up his stand in the same place. I know. When you were, when you were talking about that, imagine if you saw that book. I was thinking of all the times when we've seen something similar to that that we either couldn't afford or mm-hmm. or just slipped away in some other capacity. Yeah. It very much reminds me of, you know, like Henry Darger or some of those other yeah. outsider artists who used clippings and sort of found sources to illustrate their own vision. So who made this book originally? Well, it's sort of an unlikely guy. You know, when you think of outsider artists, you think like, oh, he was a janitor for 60 years, and then when he died, they went in his room, and he had 750,000 pages of a manuscript, or right. or he lived in the backwoods of Kentucky, and he was a preacher, and they found this in his house. And it's like, you know, there's kind of a a preconception nowadays of what outsider art means, which even I have some, you know, I have some issues with calling it. I am only calling it outsider art for, for lack of a better term. Yeah. It's the shorthand term that people understand, I think. But this guy is very unlike any of those other, in that he was very wealthy. He inherited a business from his father. He was, his name was John Bingley Garland and he was born in 1791 in Dorset, England. He was very wealthy His father owned a business, and he was sent to Newfoundland. They were fish traders, and he was sent to Trinity, Newfoundland, to manage the family's business. He became a justice of the peace, he erected a church, and he returned to England in 1821 and served of mayor of Poole in 1824 and 1830. He left and went out to Newfoundland again, and started to he became the first speaker of the Newfoundland Parliament. Wow. Which seems sort of like an unusual trajectory for, you know, a gothic outsider artist. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He had lots of children. He was very religious. He returned to England and ran the family firm, which gave him these opportunities to have the wealth that would be needed to get these kind of books. And some people think that this book was entirely a one-off that he just did, like in a moment of motivation for his daughter. Yeah, it's thought to be a wedding gift, right? Yeah. But maybe not. I'm not sure because the the date doesn't really align and there's no... It's definitely dedicated to just his daughter, not his daughter and future son-in-law who was a reverend. Mm -hmm. My assumption would be that it was a wedding gift, that it would be 
the date would coincide, and it's about a year off. But the family that owned it for so long said that they had always heard that it was a wedding gift. Hmm. So he has a quote in the book, I guess, to his daughter. A legacy left in this lifetime for her future examination by her affectionate father, 1854. So how do you think Wall got this? You said you believe there may be some evidence or some some trail to follow that may lead to, to some idea where he got it. Well, besides the fact that he would have been friendly with all of the, the rare book dealers in England because of he was always buying extremely high-end rare first editions, he also was very into pre-Raphaelite art, and he wrote a book on Rossetti at a time when it wasn't popular, as I mentioned. In the larger sphere of pre-Raphaelites is also Edward Byrne Jones, who, while not one of the original pre-Raphaelites, is sometimes sort of assumed to be part of that world. Yeah, I've always grouped him in. With yeah, them. yeah. And sometimes they call him like second wave or like lesser pre-Raphaelite. But mm-hmm. he's generally his style is termed as being pre-Raphaelite, even though he wasn't part of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Four collages of the same artist show up, larger in scale. Four garland collages. Four, four garland collages show up. They're larger in scale than the wedding book, but they have the all the telltale signs of his artwork. So they look like yeah. the page of the book. They have the, the gold on them. They have the red India ink. They have the religious iconography. They have the uh, same handwriting reprinting poems of a biblical nature. And they're owned by succession by the, the grandson and great-grandson of Edward Byrne Jones. All of them? The four collages, yes. All these four collages. Now they've been scattered. One's at the Getty, and I think other ones might be in, in private hands. It shows that it, this was an ongoing artistic endeavor. Right. It, it wasn't a one-off. So there are more extant artworks by Garland. When they were acquired from the Byrne Jones family by a collector, he kept a bunch of them for himself. And when he passed away in 2019, the ones that he had retained for himself, these four images were then sold at large, but others exist. And he had sold them, I guess, privately at other times. I don't know where those are, but I think what we know of right now is the collection and the the wedding album, and then the four that have been sort of scattered to the winds rather recently, one or more of which is at the Getty in California. So there is a chance that we could own one, is what you're saying? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't check how much the Getty paid for it, but the Getty's got significantly more scratch than we have. <laughs> I'm just saying, we might run into one at an auction one day. I would like that. I don't think it would be a stretch to call us collectors. Mm-hmm. Right? Have you looked around? What is your favorite book? Now, not book to read. Mm-hmm. What is your favorite, like, collectible book? That we own? Yeah. There's, I mean, I have a, a lot of beautiful art books that we own, but one that comes to mind is we have a book we bought of, um, I think it's Italian cemeteries. Oh, yeah. And... I just bought it because the cover looked really cool. It was like a a marble bust, and it was an older edition, like turn of the century. Uh, Really cool, like gilt lettering, I believe, on it. And it has this pop-out folio of all of the monuments in this particular cemetery. And then I turned the one, and I I was like, why does this look so familiar? And then then it occurred to me, it's the monument that's on the cover of Joy Division's Closer album, which is, you know, my all-time favorite album, just from the time I was 14 that Nothing a, has has bumped it out of first place. That was a cool find. So that one's probably pretty up there. I mean, I don't think we've ever paid too, too much for a book. No. It's just sort of been serendipity that we've fallen on things that we just kind of fall in love with. Mine is Willie Pogany's Parsifal. In the early 1900s, he illustrated, I don't, I think three Wagner operas. We were in an antique store one day and... I found a copy of this Parsifal. It was very expensive, 
and I was looking at it, and I was like, this thing is incredible. You talk about an art book. There are some reproductions in, like, some collections mm -hmm. of Pagani's work, but they do not do it justice. He designed this whole book. He illustrated it, but he designed it as well. He's responsible for some of the murals at one of the local... Doesn't he have murals at the either the Strand or the Capitol in downtown New York? Yeah, at the Strand, I believe. Yeah. He's a fantastic artist. Fantastic artist. Illustrator. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. <laughs> but Parsifal is... There's like gold ink, like metallic gold ink, you know, overlaid with, uh, you, you know, overlaid over the, the black and white illustrations. There's tipped in full color prints. The book itself is a work of art. I love it very much. I did not get the copy that was at that antique store, but I, I was able to track down another copy eventually, which is not in great shape. The binding's broken, but I love this book. It's just this perfect example of like what a book can be. It's velvet too, isn't it? It's like yeah, but the, there were different editions. There's they, like a white leather yeah. edition and mm -hmm. like a purple velvet edition. I, this probably harkens back to what Evelyn Wall found so compelling about the fact that those his book collecting really is it's art collecting. Yeah, fine books are really art collections, and very much like your cemetery book. I'm flipping through this. Willie Pogany book. And I come to a page and it's got a knight slaying a dragon. And the dragon sort of winds into the background and is kind of wrapped around a maiden in one of the coils or something. Very kind of, you know, romantic knight kind of scene. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, boy, that looks familiar. And suddenly it hits me that the cover of my favorite album, a band called Cobb, this is not the metal band, Children of Whatever that is. This is a band from the early 70s, Clive's own band or Clive's original band called Cobb. It was a folk band. They did two albums. Their second album, Moisha McStiff and the Tartan Lancers of the Sacred Heart. The artist for the album cover obviously was looking at this Pogany illustration. I mean, it's it's the Pogany. It's not the same illustration. It's mm -hmm. not done as well. Yeah, it's actually a poor version of the Pogany illustration mm -hmm. on the cover of this album. But here's this book. And inside is the artwork that inspired very heavily, the cover of my favorite album, Moishi McStiff and the Tartan Lancers of the Sacred Heart. And it's just like one of these moments, it's just like where everything comes together. And wow. maybe that's what kind of got me back on the radar of it, because I'm like working on this project about pre raphaelites We probably will talk about them again. But that's probably where I started looking at it again, because of his Evelyn Wall's book on Rossetti. Interestingly, that, I mean, you got this Victorian blood book not knowing any of this. No, and I really, really love Evelyn Wall, and I had no idea that it, it, it was had belonged any to his collection. I mean, I think I, I don't even know that I knew that he was like a big book collector. I mean, I mainly knew of him because like Brides Had Revisited plays really heavily stylistically in what people were doing in England as far as like aping earlier generations as far as their aesthetics. So like people were copying the the haircuts of like the 1840 or the 1940s, which show up in uh, Brides Had Re Revisited. Mm -hmm. People were aping them when? Oh, in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, like new wave kind of and post-punk scene. I knew what you were talking about. <laughs> I didn't know. It was clear to the audience. As you mentioned, people can see images from this book at the Harry Ransom website. We'll put links up if we can. There's also, you can see uh, a picture at the Getty website of one of the other collages. And if you if you search, it's not under his name. It's not difficult to find pictures of the four collages, which were most recently sold. There, I, I think it would be fascinating to sit and go through each one of the transcribed handwritten poems just to kind of come up with an idea of, of all the different sources yeah. that he was working from and all the different poems. and It's interesting because the, the reprint book we have is in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So it does translate each page, page for page. But the translation is from the English written mm -hmm. page in the original to Spanish. And the reproduction is unfortunately very small. I guess if we took a magnifying glass, we might be able to read the poems. Mm -hmm. But I wish they would reprint this in a in a large format. I think it really deserves it. Yeah, I think so too. Or at least I would love to even have like a, a print. 
I don't think we mentioned earlier that it's sometimes subtitled Durenstein. Oh, no, we did not mention that. Which is a reference to the Austrian castle where Richard the Lionheart was kept for a while. So it's always echoing these like battles of religious faith. Cue the Bee Gees. (laughs) Every Christian lionhearted man. (laughs) Second favorite album. We live our entire lives knowing that death awaits us. Many believe that some part of us endures. Eyewitnesses swear to have seen spirits of the dead haunting the living and even appearing during alien abductions. Is the UFO mystery reaching out to us from beyond the stars or from beyond the grave? This staggering implication demands not only scrutiny of the UFO phenomenon, but near-death experiences, ancient monuments, ley lines, the fey folk, cryptids, and more. I'm Joshua Cutchin. I'd like to invite you into the Ecology of Souls, a new mythology of death and the paranormal, a comprehensive theory of all things supernatural framed through the lens of our final transition. Join me as we journey from the depths of prehistory to the present, from the outer space of the cosmos to the inner space of the self. Ecology of Souls, Volumes 1 and 2, now available from Amazon in print and as a combined ebook. Welcome to the Ecology of Souls. So you found another interesting aspect of Victorian books. It's not really directly related to the Victorian blood book in any way other than this is Victorian era stuff that has to do with books. Yeah, with sort of a dark subject matter inadvertently. So remember the early days of the pandemic when you're like, yay, we got a can of peaches today and now we can eat? (laughs) Way back when. (laughs) Way back when. That was also a time when I spent a lot of time looking at online museums and online libraries. I was... Mm -hmm. Which was actually great because I think we did a whole episode on like the Pitt Rivers Museum in uh, yes. Europe, and we kind of talked about building your own cabinets of curiosity. Do you yes. remember that? Remember yeah, the, I, I do remember Remember that. the early days of the pandemic? Yeah. Because the nostalgia uh, cycle goes so quickly now, we can already start being nostalgic for the early days of the pandemic. <laughs> we can start being nostalgic for past episodes of Strange Familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in that time, I did a, a lot of just sort of boredom research and boredom looking at different libraries and museums. And that's probably where I, I started to really dive into the Harry Ransom. But this co- this information comes from Delaware, not the Delaware Art Museum, which is my favorite Delaware good, museum. It's a good museum. And not the Wyeth Museum, which is a very close second. Which isn't in Delaware, but it's very close. It's very close. Yeah, that's, I always think of it the same because we do it the same day. Mm-hmm. But this is the museum that is always difficult for me to pronounce because you, you want to say Winterthur, but it isn't. It's actually Winter Tour. Mm-hmm. But then that sounds pretentious. It's like when you pronounce gyro the right way. <laughs> I feel like if you didn't grow up in that culture, you should just probably say gyro and not sound like the guy that's trying too hard. But I also say moog and not, I know it's moog. Mm-hmm. But if you say it, you know, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like uh, Glenn Danzig's second band. Yeah. If you say Sawin. Eh, it sounds wrong. Mm-hmm. Just say Sam Hain, right? Yeah. We know what the right thing is, but we also know how we say it. It's like... You know how if you say something in a particular area, that's technically the correct right. way to say yeah. something. Yeah. My favorite example of that is Havard de Grace, Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's technically the right way to say it, but and we are not going to pronounce it in any way close to what the French pronunciation should be, but it isn't Havard de Grace. <laughs> it's like Av de Gras or something, right? Yeah, we're going to get in trouble for it, even saying it that way. Neither is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. There's no chance I could be correct with that. I'm saying it's like less than 5%. <laughs> Someone who speaks French. Please pronounce it correctly. And if I'm right, what are you going to give me? You're not going to be, so this is pointless. Uh, uh, and, and the thing is, you have to define right. If I, oh, I wish this was visual because I'm doing a lot of air quotes right now. <laughs> so I get nothing if I'm right. That's what you're saying. For your like bastardized Baltimore version of French? No. Bastardized. First of all, don't ever call me Baltimore. 
<laughs> I grew up in northern Baltimore County. It's a different, it's I was a, way closer to Pennsylvania than I was to Baltimore City. Okay. Way closer. I bet a dialect coach could probably pinpoint within a mile where each of us is from. Possibly. I'm kind of digressing from the books. We are digressing because so I'm anyway, we're trying back. to get something out of the minute possibility that I may have said something correctly. Sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway, at the Winter Tour Museum, they're doing some interest. Which, which museum is this again? The Winter Tour Museum. I, I mispronounced it. At the Winter Tour Museum, I actually looked online. Now, when are they open? Spring and summer. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little window into how most of our conversations go. Uh, anyway, sorry, 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 everybody. The Winter Tour Museum. Yes. The Winter Tour Museum. I probably still pronounce it. The Winter Tour Museum is doing some interesting research into a hazard involving books. And that is... Bookworms. No. And bed bugs would be another great potential example, but neither of those are accurate. Scorpions. Scorpions that just lay in wait, like mm -hmm. in the middle of the pages. Book scorpions. Book scorpions. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're traditionally found only on bookmarks. Haunted books. That is a problem only on Etsy. But it's rampant there. <laughs> no, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Wait. No, the problem is arsenic and lead, which leads to some amazing colors. You know, we have this idea that Victorian life was very dark Right. And bland. Yeah, because of the black and white photos, I think. I think we've talked about it before. We this yeah, now, what I always like to say is even like in early photography, a yellow dress reads black. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes people think that people are in mourning and really they're wearing like a bright sunny dress unless you know the, and I only know certain clues about mourning dress. And that's one of those things that you have to kind of be more of an expert in, not necessarily just seeing a black dress. Mm-hmm. So the Victorians loved really bright colors, almost psychedelic, like yellow and greens and peacock blues. And it became fashionable to have certain colors in fabrics and shoes, wallpaper. There's a very famous case, which has been up for some debate lately about whether William Morris's wallpaper actually killed people or not. And that's because of the same arsenic content in it. That's a whole nother episode. <laughs> but these books really are filled with arsenic. <laughs> the covers of this particular color green are filled with arsenic. And so they're cautioning people to be careful. And they are even offering a special bookmark that has a whole range of book covers on it that are in these shades. So you can help identify which books might actually have an arsenic content. They also have the names of the books. And I immediately went, we should collect these. <laughs> <laughs> So is, is the danger in handling them? The danger is in handling them. And it's not, they're basically saying put them in like a a bag so you're not directly touching them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not like you're inhaling little bits of like a chemical into your lungs or anything like that. So this is perfectly safe on a shelf. It's somewhere. perfectly safe, I believe. I mean... Right, yeah. We're not we're, with the caveat that I have no expertise whatsoever. Right, we're not don't take health advice from us, but <laughs> as far as you know, you think Yeah, you if think, you saw what we ate, you would know this was <laughs> true. As far as you know, it's okay to, to sit them. Yeah, they them. have uh, the protocols online which you can research yourself. Basically, you're talking about safe handling procedures where you'd want to wear the proper gloves, you want to put it in a bag if it's in your own collection and um, you want to just avoid direct handling or and wash it just basic safety protocols when you're unsure about things that might have lead or arsenic in them and wash your hands really well before you eat. None of this stuff? The like, licking your fingers to turn the pages? Probably not. Yeah. Although the pages may be less so than the actual, it's the covers. Well, I'm figuring your one hand's on the cover and then the other hand's on the cover and then you're licking your finger to turn the pages. It's probably not a good idea. Yeah. And you're it, drinking. Don't, uh, don't lick your fingers to turn pages anyway. Yeah. And don't, and you're probably sitting there with your uranium glass cup <laughs> with your old science kit with a little piece of asbestos in it corner folding too who told me recently they was it who told me recently they fold the corners of the i just oh just find a bookmark tear a piece of paper 
There's just literally paper everywhere that you're trying to get rid of. Fold the corners. Don't fold the corners. But it's an improper system anyway, because like, what if you go back and you've already folded seven quarters and you're unclear where you were? Yeah. Or if someone might have folded it before you? Right. I'm never going to be down with that. Yeah. On this, we can agree. On the pronunciation of Haver de Grace. Oh, no, it's Haver de Grace. (laughs) Well, it is actually. Yeah, it is. And it really is Schuylkill. Yes. It is that word. Mm-hmm. If you're not into arsenic, but you're really into lead, you can collect chrome yellow books, which are that sort of aged school bus yellow color. Okay. They have the same properties, but they're lead are these, based. Are these hardcover books? No, they're more of... Um, like the fabric covered kind? Fabric or the kind that are like a softer binding. Like not, they're not leather, but they're, mm-hmm. I mean, you can tell they're fabric based. Okay. This is also true with uh, daguerreotypes. So sometimes the pillow, if it's green, in the really, really, really early cases, I have heard that that has. So we didn't talk about the color for the arsenic. We were talking about arsenic. But, oh but yeah, the, so the, it's this like really beautiful green color, mm-hmm. and a lot of times there's like gold gilt uh, letters and things to uh, juxtapose with that color to just make it really pop. I mean, they're beautiful books, and they have a whole registry of ones that they've already tested that are definitely filled with arsenic because they actually do um, the process there at the library to determine if they have an arsenic content. Has anyone gotten physically ill from these? While they were handling to do that? I mean, I'm sure they're handling them in a safe way, so I don't think... I mean, like, just someone, just random person. I don't know that we'd ever know that conclusively. Mm. Like, are they just going to blame the books and they think it could be something else? Like, I don't know. Like, maybe... Someone who's like a, a Maybe book dealer or something? someone turns up at a hospital mm-hmm. with arsenic poisoning. Yeah. And they're like, w- what are you, in a murder mystery from 1938? <laughs> <laughs> what, arsenic and old lace or something? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, no, I was, I don't know how I got arsenic poisoning, but it was from, they're a rare, rare book dealer and they didn't know. This was so popular then with this may or may not be true William Morris story that it led to something called arsenophobia, Mm. where people, instead of like pulling these particular fabrics and wallpapers, it just became unfashionable because people were a little worried about it. Oh, okay. So they didn't really have to put in any safety protocols. Is this back then? Yeah. So they knew back then. So they were using arsenic. Yeah. To make these colors. Like that's how you get these colors. Yeah. In the same way that, like, when you're making glass, you're using cadmium and you're using the colors that have radioactive content are the same yellows and greens. Mm -hmm. And some of that glass dates back to that same time period. Yeah. So if if you like yellow and green... So did they know this about the books? They knew this about the William Morris... They suspected it, which led to a popular worry about it. And even there was rumors that... Napoleon died. I mean, he's technically died of stomach cancer, but he had just been in a room that was papered and all green, and they thought maybe that was... Mm. It's hard to say. I don't know that we're ever going to 100% know. There are some scientists who said there's absolutely no way that this could have happened. Was was he tall enough to actually reach the the wallpaper? (laughs) That's the question. He had a little tucked in his his breast pocket. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, That's what he's always looking for in there. (laughs) He just has a wallpaper sample in there. It's flocked. It feels good to touch. It's like a fidget spinner for the 1800s. <laughs> this is how most episodes go, and then Tim reins me back in. Like, this is how, if I present an episode, I just kind of throw 18,000 different notebooks that I've written things in, and I'm like, this is what I want to do. And he's like, should we write an outline? I was like, no, I can wing it. And then we spend two nights of me going... I don't know what to say next. And then we write an outline and then we get back into it. But you're getting a little window into like the reality of <laughs> <laughs> the chaotic mind of that. <laughs> There's stuff in there. It's just not all organized. How many of these poison books do we own? I'm kind of dreading asking this question. I haven't looked yet. I'm kind of going with a Schrodinger's arsenic book. There's probably quite a few. This is the thing I started, I, I went. This is not what you should do, but this is what I immediately did. I went to their directory of things that they found that are absolutely conclusively arsenic laden. Mm-hmm. And then I went to eBay to check out how much they cost. Because <laughs> <laughs> you want to start collecting. I wanted to start collecting them. Are they, have they gone up in value because they have arsenic? No, they weren't advertised as such, but I found 
matching titles and the color. So it's almost invariably the right thing. They're, some are kind of a bargain. I mean, right. you can buy into this arsenic laden book deal for like less than 50 bucks. This would be really good if we had one to sell right now. That would be like a seamless transition. Oh, for curiosity. curiosity of the week. Here's a poison book for the curiosity of the week. I mean, we've been selling the poison glass for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it is not poison. Inconclusive. No. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at this load of old books over here that we haven't gone through yet. Oh, yeah. There's probably some poison books in there. And now I'm going to be looking. Yeah. I probably will have some for sale, to be honest. We'll put them in bags. You can decide what you want to do with them. If That's I, my thought. If I turn up dead from arsenic poisoning, someone check out my wife. I'm just saying. Bury him and have her to grace. <laughs> His spiritual homeland. <laughs> I've only been there once. Isn't it? It's the county seat of one of the, isn't it? Of uh, uh, Yeah, but I've only town. been there once to have her to grace proper. I, think we've I remember driven. liking it. On um, the next episode of Strange Familiars, Tim and Allison go to... Have her degree. <laughs> Bet you can get some good crabs there. That's true. <laughs> so uh, there's a place that documents these books. Winter Tour is doing it. If you look at their website, they will send you the aforementioned free bookmark, bookmark which has a color codes based on which green books tend to be ar- arsenic laden. Are they... Collecting them? Are they are they like having people? If people don't want them, are they saying like send them to us? From other libraries, they're taking them out of the general collections and putting them in with the rare books, just so people, I guess, have to ask to to see them and mm-hmm. they can follow proper protocols. I don't know how much risk there is, and and especially with the lead, I think the the lead risk is probably higher for children than it is for adults. Isn't there a higher threshold for? I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. You still don't really want to mess with any of this stuff, but. Mm-hmm. Everything in the Victorian era could kill you. <laughs> I was at an antique store one time, and someone had, I'm guessing this was probably from the 20s or 30s, mm-hmm. not Victorian era. And it was like a little trick toy, like a prank thing. Mm-hmm. It said, push here. Mm-hmm. It was like a little thing. So you did it. So I pushed on, and a tack came up and went like right through my thumb. Mm-hmm. I'm like, a rusty old tack. Yeah. First of all, fun game. Yeah. I like the game of lockjaw. Hilarious prank. Yeah. Here, press that button. Ha <laughs> ha. You just got a, a tack through your thumb. Yeah. Hilarious. And if but you like that, you'll love a tetanus shot. The person at the stand, why wouldn't they put that in a box? Or put a cork on the end of it or, or something. Or something. Mm-hmm. Put it in a showcase or something. This yeah. Is, you know, or put a warning on it. Or maybe don't touch things that aren't yours. It said press here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember you telling me the story about how your dad used to melt down and make his own lead soldiers as oh, a yeah. kid. Yeah. Can you imagine letting our kids make their own lead soldiers? No. no. <laughs> nope. But your dad also told a story about going to, down to the uh what was, he lived near what a POW camp? Mm, yeah. During the Second World War and he would go down and trade things with the German soldiers that were in the POW yeah, camp. Yeah, they would pay him. I guess they they would do work and get paid a little bit of money. Mm-hmm. He would go buy him chocolate bars. At the drugstore. They'd hand him money through the fence, and he'd go to the drugstore and buy him chocolate bars and bring them back. So he was aiding the enemy. I mean, yeah. he yeah. probably prolonged the Second World War. So don't lick your books. Don't lick books. Particularly if they're... Yellow or green. And old. Mm-hmm. If you've got to lick a book, go for a darker... Maybe a leather. That seems safer. Mm-hmm. But not maybe not with the gilt. I don't know what's in the, the gilding, the gold gilding. Yeah. Don't lick books. Don't lick books. Of any age. Yeah. How about that? We'll just put that out there. Yeah. Don't lick books. It's an interesting thing, for sure. It doesn't seem to be a huge worry. Like, they're not telling people, like, you have to get rid of these books. No. They're just saying be careful. Yeah. I, I think we're just becoming wiser to environmental toxins generally. I'm sure there are things that we use right now that we probably won't in 20 years. We'll find sure. out. Yeah. I mean, the same with, like, aluminum. Right. You know, you know. Our parents' grandparents cooked with aluminum. Now don't use aluminum. We put everything in the microwave for five minutes till it decomposed and had its <laughs> the half life was reached. <laughs> uh, dangerous to be a Victorian. Dangerous to be a Victorian. A lot of stuff was looking. But they're a hardy stock if you can make it past five or six years old. Yeah, yeah. A lot of innovation and a lot of experimentation. I also like the fact that this is something that actually probably wouldn't have affected poor people. 
This is the one, mm. the one thing that isn't disproportionately right. So you're not going to get black lung and arsenic poisoning from, from from your fine art or from your fine book collection. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One day we'll have to do a, an episode on the people who got basically the equivalent of black lung by making mother of pearl buttons. Ooh, and then of course there's the Hatters. Yep. Who and literally went mad from that was from lead, right? It's mercury, wasn't it? Because was it it, it's the same thing that um, daguerreotypists went crazy from. <laughs> ah, then we can do an episode on the glass harmonica too. Uh -huh. Ben Franklin's instrument, very interesting. All right, I guess that's enough Victorian book talk for today. Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours presents Transcendent Paranormal Conference and Vendor Fair, Saturday, September 17th, 2022, at the Scranton Cultural Center, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Three floors of vendors. Presentations from Jason Halls, Sherry DeBenedetti, The Paranormal Couple, Eric Altman, and Timothy Renner. For more information, email info at wyomingvalleyghosttours.com or go to facebook.com slash Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours. That's facebook.com slash Wyoming Valley Ghost Tours. Our oddity has a tear in it, Allison. I don't find it to be... Um... You know, sometimes people pick up things with tears or blemishes, and then that's like a no-go kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't personally subscribe to that notion that things are ruined if there's some kind of imperfection. Oh, there's a crack in everything. That's how, how the, the light, light gets in. <laughs> this appears to be a First Communion photo. Which I thought was sort of like, sort of appropriate. You know, I like a theme and I never have any Bigfoot photos, so... <laughs> I thought this was, uh, even though there is a rip on it and, and it would be priced accordingly for, it looks like someone put a fork through it perhaps, <laughs> but it's a really cool picture of uh, a First Communion photo with a little girl, maybe a little sister of the girl's First Communion. For a while you were collecting these First Communion photos. They are quite pretty. Yeah, and there's some that I'll probably always keep, but I don't need all of them. It's not Pokemon. 1890. Uh, later, I'd say. Later. I'd say 1900 and 1910 because it's – and the cool thing about it is uh, it's gelatin silver. So when you look at it in a certain light, her entirely white communion dress for a second turns black. Oh, it's like a um, – Not like lenticular, but like – Yeah, kind of like that. Is this still called a cabinet card at this time? I would say it's just a mounted, mounted card. Mounted photo of First Communion. There will be an image of this in our show notes if you click on that. It'll take you to our Etsy shop where you can buy that and other curiosities of the week. While you are at our Etsy shop, you can pick up other things from us. Allison has a lot of other photos there she has listed. We have Strange Familiars t-shirts, the original classic Awoken Tree design. Copies of my artwork, both originals and prints. My books are there and more. Our shop name at Etsy is Lost Grave. But if you type in Strange Familiars, you should see our stuff come up. Purchasing from our Etsy shop helps support the show, so we want to thank everyone for checking that out. And while you're on Etsy, you can check out Chad Shop, Ruck Rabbit Outdoors, and our friends at Karmic Garden as well. You know I love folklore books, Allison, speaking of books. I do. Jay Leroy, very, very nice fellow, sent me a big box of books of folklore from the Hudson Valley place I really want to go because I really want to go to Alana, which is in the Hudson Valley, and you've never taken me. Let's so now, do now's your excuse. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. So expect some Hudson Valley shows coming up, I guess, because uh, <laughs> I got lots of folklore books on it. I love folklore books from everywhere. I have a nice collection of folklore books, and I want to thank Jay for adding to them. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful package. They will be put to good use, to strangely familiar use, if I may say so. All right. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back soon with more.
Are you fascinated by UFOs, the occult, strange history, and more? On October 14th through the 16th at SIR Nashville, the Strange Realities Conference 2022 will take place. Three days of exploring the mysteries of the supernatural, history, UFOs, the occult, and much, much more. Featuring presentations by Steve Berg, Micah Hanks, John Tinney, Adam Go Rightly, Tim Banal, Christopher Ernst, Samantha Engel, Recluse, Nathan Isaac, Melody Blackthorn, Dr. Future, Soraya Ascath, Timothy Ritter, Aaron Gullius, Delaney Bowers, Olaf Phillips, and David Metcalf. With workshops by Kiki Dombrowski, Ren Collier, and Michael Hughes. Come join us in Nashville or online. Tickets are available at strangerealitiesconference.com. Find out what everyone is talking about. It's 